My talk is entitled The Circle of Life, and I was actually looking for a word that would describe it better. I was looking for a word in the English language that had both life and death implied within the word, and I couldn't find one. If someone has a word like that, please let me know sometime today. So before I get into most of the talk, I'd like to start with a poem written by Michael de Montague in about the year 1580. And it goes, we come and we go and we trot and we dance and never a word about death. All's well and good, but when death does come to us, our family, our friends, our lovers, catching us unaware and unprepared, what cries of fury and what storms of passion overwhelm us. Let's begin to adopt a way clean contrary to the popular one. Let us get used to it. Let us frequent it. Let us have nothing in mind more often than the hour of our own death. For those who have learned how to die have unlearned how to be a slave. In the last 400 years, not much has changed, really, as far as our society view of the completion of the circle of life. There is no life without death that I'm aware of. And to get around talking about it and to use words that are less emotionally reactive, I like to say that death is a four-letter word. As a hospice nurse for the last 20 years, and I've worked with 1,000 people that have died, unless you're experiencing the process yourself or within your family, we tend to deny it, pretend it doesn't exist, and do whatever we can to avoid it. So I've got a list of euphemism, euphemisms that are quite often used. They haven't died. They've passed on. They've crossed over. They've brought the farm. They've met their maker. They've kicked the bucket. They're with the angels. They've, they're deceased. They're on the wrong side of the grass. And my new favorite, it's a dirt nap. <laughs> so when I was very young, growing up as a Polish Catholic outside of Detroit, and I was an altar boy, I would envision life as a long and winding road with all these adventures awaiting me. And what was at the end of the road? Well, really, we don't need to think about that, and we don't need to talk about that. So in 1977, I graduated from Michigan Tech with a degree in nursing. And it was after studying psychology I went into nursing, inspired by a, by a Vietnam vet, Mike Horan, who was becoming a nurse. And I was so eager to save lives when I got out of school. I went to work in Petoskey, and in a short time, I became the head nurse of a neuroscience unit. It was so much fun saving lives. I can honestly say we had two red codes at the same time on my floor, and I got to be part of two resuscitations at the same time. Pretty cool stuff. Then when I moved back to the Copper Country in 1985, I wanted to work in ICU because that's where the action was. I got to be, I got to be uh, certified in advanced cardiac life support. I did CPR on a lot of people. I got to shock people, intubate people, put tubes in every orifice that you have. And I got to be very, very good at it. And I was proud of myself. Uh, saving lives was so cool. Unfortunately, if someone died, that meant someone screwed up. We missed something. We didn't catch this. We should have done this instead. And the doctors in the hospital system are sort of like a bunch of gods. You don't have to answer to one god. You have to answer to a bunch of gods. If something goes wrong, there's always the witch hunt to find out what could have been done better. It was exceptionally hard if it was a child that died. And I would say in those days, and this was from the late 80s through the early 90s, I had no context of how to deal with the loss of life outside of trying to preserve it at any cost. Then something happened that changed my life forever. I was taking care of a woman, Katie, who had been brought into the emergency room, uh, who had suffered a, a cardiac and respiratory arrest. She had filled out all of the paperwork, all the forms, and she had decided at her age, with her condition, she did not want to be resuscitated. She wanted to be allowed to die. Unfortunately, her daughter and her sister were with her, and they called 911, and they started CPR. And when I met her, she was on a ventilator coming from the emergency room into my ICU, and I was her nurse for the next four days. 
Three of those days I was taking care of her as tenderly as I could with her hands tied to the bed with a tube in, into her bladder, to a catheter to drain her urine. I had to give her frequent shots of morphine because it's almost impossible for a human being to tolerate a tube into your trachea without freaking out. If anybody's had that experience, let's talk later. Uh, after three days of this, knowing that she would hardly ever be able to come off of the ventilator, she was so weak and frail, she pleaded with her eyes and trying to make mouth motions around her tube to please let her come off the machine. The doctor finally relented. There was an unofficial ethical meeting. Her hands were unrestrained. She was not sedated long enough so she could sign a form. And it was, she was signing her own death form. She was signing the form, take me off this machine so I can die. Now, that would be something just in of itself. But what really changed me was how she died. I came on duty at 3 o'clock. She had been extubated at 2.30, and I got to be her nurse until she took her last breath at 7.30. I got to be the one to take her cardiac leads off, to take her tubes out later. She died with so much courage, with so much grace, with so much beauty. She was accepting. She was blowing kisses to her daughter and her sister. She was exuding so much love that all of a sudden, after she had died, I realized, I don't want to be an ICU nurse anymore. And that was the beginning of the journey. That's why I'm on the stage today. I became a hospice nurse. And for 17 years, I helped, I helped start the Kiwana Home Nursing Hospice Program in 1993. I served as a hospice nurse and program manager for 17 years. And it started to change my view of life and death dramatically. Also, something else happened during that time. I have, I have four daughters, and as I was raising my daughters with my wife Vicki in our Keweenaw County home that we built, we also took care of my mother, Virginia, as she slowly faded out in the last two decades of her life. When she came to live with us after my father died, she was about 70 and she was blind, and she had two heart attacks, she had two strokes, and slowly and slowly, slowly, she needed more and more help. And while I was caring for Virginia, and maybe helping her eat or get something for her or helping her with personal care or just tending to her needs. Over and over, images from childhood would come back to me. I remember when I was feeding her that I was sitting in a wooden high chair with rabbits on it and she was spoon feeding me poached eggs. I was probably two or three years old. That memory came back. Tucking her in at night into bed, I remember her tucking me in and me praying to God, please protect my mom. I don't know what I could do without her. And then those images kept occurring as I was providing her care and my, sister, and my wife was and my, my children were, that life has come full circle. It no longer seemed a linear event starting here and ending there, but it was a process. And then I realized with four daughters, I'm one of the luckiest people on the earth. What's the number one indicator of who will not die in a nursing home? It's a person with three or more daughters. <laughs> During this time in hospice, watching people die, people supported by their families, people with deep faith, people with excellent medical care, people who took good care of themselves, I would ask every minister, every clergy person, that I, come, I came across, and I met almost everyone in the Copper Country. I would ask Baptists, Catholics, Unitarians, whatever, how can a merciful God allow this kind of stuff to happen to people? And no one had an answer. And then at age 40, I attended a Tibetan Buddhist retreat. And during that retreat, something shifted, something very major shifted. It was with Silgil Rinpoche, it was in Montreal, and he's the author of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. After a very long teaching about life, he concluded with the reason people die and suffer who are good people is because life is like that. And there was a shift in me where I stopped pushing back against that, like that death was the enemy, and I started accepting it more and more. Now, when you work bedside year after year, month after month, with people who are dying and their families, it changes you. There are certain things you either, you either get hardened or you get softened. 
And through my work in hospice, I found some things that help me personally dealing with my own feelings of mortality. I've had several friends die in the last year. I've had family members die in the last few years. All of you, no matter where you go throughout this planet, when you leave Michigan Tech, will encounter loss. And the things that I have found most helpful is that rather than just responding to suffering with either sadness or indifference, we can respond with compassion and that by witnessing suffering and not turning your head and not closing your heart, that compassion can grow very strong. And I made a vow to do whatever I can to help the people dying in the copper country die as with as much dignity and with much pain-free as possible. And I went about helping educate the staff of our hospice and the local medical community by bringing in national speakers on end-of-life care that we could provide as good a care here as anywhere. Now, one of the hardest things I encountered in my hospice work was meeting with people who were dying, who lived alone and had no one to care for them. Literally, I would have to go and visit an old woman, leave knowing that maybe no one would come back the next day until I did. No one would see her and she couldn't even get out of bed. The hardest thing I ever did as a nurse in hospice was move someone to a nursing home who didn't want to go, but they couldn't stay home alone. So in 1999, Myself, along with Bill Sewell, if anybody remembers Bill Sewell, professor of philosophy and ethics at Michigan Tech, he taught out of this very same building. Bill Sewell and I and Scott Rutherford met for a year. They were hospice volunteers. What can we do about this situation of people not being able to stay home? And we decided we can at least try to do something. So in 1999, we gathered 10 people together, including Dr. Janners and Magdalena Belay, who are still involved since then. And we formed a board of directors, and we said, we are gonna build a hospice house in the Copper Country. <clears throat> From 2001 to 2003, we raised $1.2 million against the advice of many of the financial experts in the community. What they said was, there's not enough money in the community to do this, and you won't be able to sustain it. But we opened Omega House in 2005, and since then, 300 people in our area, over 300 now, have spent their last months and weeks and days of life at Omega House getting care. Who gives the care? The majority of the care is provided by volunteers, just like you. Women and men, mostly women, who give freely of their time to go to Omega House to help care for people who are dying so they're not alone. If you took Sharon Avenue from right across the street, followed it all the way around past Econo Foods, all the way to the Bluffs, Omega House is your last driveway before the Bluffs. To me, Omega House is compassion and action. <clears throat> Rilke said uh, several centuries ago that our darkest fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasures. And I think when we can learn to face some of those fears, tremendous things can occur out of that. 33% of all the people we've cared for at Omega House have been veterans. And my life has been made very much enriched by my involvement with hospice and Omega House. I stepped down from the board last year after over 10 years, and now I spend 20 hours a week raising the money to help run the house. My job is to raise $160,000 a year so that anyone who goes there, if they have no money or not, we can care for them. And this year, we're at $157,000 already. So thank you for listening. I hope this inspires you in some way. And good day. <clears throat>